Have you ever wanted to become another person? Well, participating in a live action roleplay game is the way to go. Just make sure that the game you're playing is done with trusted people in a safe place and is not haunted by a Nazi ghost. That's right, our characters didn't do any of that, so let's see what happens and if we can beat the Bunker Game in, that's right, the Bunker Game 2022. Let's go. LARP, L-A-R-P, Life Action Roleplay. A type of interactive roleplaying game in which participants play characters with their own actions. So these people gather to play a game where they pretend to be different people for some time. That's pretty cool. So what kind of setting are they in? Renaissance? Sci-fi? No. They are pretending to be Nazis in a post-apocalypse where Germany won World War II. Great, let's hope the YouTube algorithm knows what a LARP is. The narrative is explained to us through old-timey footage, where a decade after the Nazis won, America launched nukes at Germany, who in return responded with nukes on their own, making the surface uninhabitable. So now, a group of selected Nazi individuals were chosen to live in a bunker until the world could be made anew in the future. It's a bit confusing at times, since they treat the history as if it was real, which is the point of the game, but of course, it's all just made up. The bunker in which this story takes place, however, was indeed a real bunker used in World War II. Now, what does a day in the life of a Nazi LAR player look like? Well, kids play, higher-ups decide what media is allowed to be viewed by the public, and doctors perform genetic experiments to ensure only proper genes are passed to offspring. Doesn't this sound like fun? But they also have a radio team listening to Germany for any updates on the surface world, but hear nothing so they just continue living on down here. One of the doctors, Gregorio, is caught having tampered with the genetics program and is thus put on trial, with the public being allowed to decide his fate. And they almost unanimously choose for him to get a one-way ticket to a gas chamber. LARPing, fun for the whole family. Later that night, after having had a strange nightmare about Slender Woman, a player named Lara wakes up and rushes to the bathroom to puke. While cleaning up, she is visited by a ghost. Well, sort of. It's actually just Gregorio who has to walk around in a white jumpsuit and a mask since his character is now dead. He is here looking to feel alive again, and Laura obliges as they get busy. She's apparently into some rough stuff as she requests a hard enough choke so that she can't speak anymore. No kink shaming in the comments, guys. Thank you. After they finish, Laura tells him that she discovered last week that she is pregnant. Gregorio is excited by the news, but she apparently doesn't want to keep it, saying that she won't throw everything away just to be a mother. Because the LARP will be over tomorrow, Gregorio drops the subject and says that they will talk about it after they finish the game in style, keeping it a secret as to what exactly he means by that. The next day, we see Gregorio putting something in Laura's bag. Her cousin, Harry, who is another player, calls him out for this, but Greg shows he's just returning a voice recorder she left in the bathroom. Greg then enters the staff room and moves a box full of what he calls top secret ending stuff. He then collects a knife that he shows to be fake before they all head to the endgame party. While dancing at the party, Laura is suddenly stricken with a vision of a ghastly looking girl and starts seeing her all around the room in various locations. She ignores this obvious red flag though, and as a slow song comes on, starts dancing with Harry. While dancing, he notices the bruises on her neck as she confesses it came from the night with Gregorio. Harry points out that he has seen Greg with other women in the bunker, but Laura apparently is aware of that. As he continues to try and convince her to leave him, she gets fed up and walks away. She then happens to run into Greg and mentions the visions of the red hat she has been having. To which she explains it's probably nothing and just her mind playing tricks with the dark. Now the lights start to flicker, urging him to check on the electricity while she returns to the party. Once back, however, she starts to not feel well and the lights go out entirely. The game runners try to play this off while staying in character until a ceiling light nearly collapses, at which point they decide that safety is more important than immersion and start to evacuate everyone from the bunker. Good call, right? since you can't enjoy a game if you're dead. 
it would probably be a good idea to have a safe word for emergency cases just like this. Otherwise, it could lead to confusion since people perhaps couldn't distinguish between fiction and reality. Of course, a collapsing ceiling light, although technically possible to be a special effect, is likely indicator enough that it's not part of the story. Still, I would opt for a safe word just in case. They curl everyone down the corridor to the bunker's only exit, a set of large metal doors. Now, seems like quite a fire hazard being set up this way. Every bunker should have at least two means of escape. If it doesn't have any alternative exits, I don't know how they get approval to use it for their game. Imagine hiding in a bunker to be safe, only for it to be turned into a death trap a bit later. Seems a bit counterintuitive to me. And means that bunkers would need bunkers themselves, spiraling into infinity. Well, that's weird. Anyway, on their way out, Laura notices Harry is bleeding. He says it's from the glass breaking and he's fine. After everyone is evacuated, the runners of the game go back inside to clean up the place and Harry volunteers to join them. On their way back inside, the lights come back on and Laura takes off her blonde wig to reveal her red hair. Now, For some reason, the film decides to really focus on this point using an excessive amount of slow motion and dodge angles. Honestly, no clue why. The only people in the bunker now are Laura and Harry, plus four other staff members named Robin, Marcus, Andre and Yasmin. And technically Gregorio should be there as well, somewhere. Robin checks the fuses, but they appear to be fine. So that means either the wires in the bunker are faulty, which is very plausible, or it means Gregorio turned off the lights for the finale. Laura denies that possibility though, as he clearly had something grander planned. Regardless of the cause, they decide to go looking for him now. They look at the scale model replica of the bunker and state that the game only takes place in one small sector, but the entirety of the bunker is much bigger. They were instructed never to go deeper inside, as it can be unstable and easily get lost in, so they decide to look there for Greg. This seems like a bad idea. If they were already told to never go in there, what would make them think Greg would have gone? If they can't find him anywhere else, I don't know why they wouldn't suspect he just left the bunker for the cleanup or whatever. As they investigate the first tunnel, the lights go out again, only for them to turn on again at the next intersection with a spotlight and a bunch of mannequins dressed like American soldiers. They speculate that this was Greg's idea for a finale, since in real life this bunker was apparently stormed by soldiers. And after seeing his box of fireworks before, which could have been used to simulate gunfire, I gotta agree that this was likely the plan. They decide to split up in order to search the various tunnels here, and agree that after 10 minutes of looking, they will give up and call for emergency services. Now, since they are in a century old bunker in a section that they are unfamiliar with, I say it's already time for them to call emergency services. If Greg is down here and still not responding, he could be seriously injured. And if he's not, it would still be better to send trained professionals in there than to aimlessly wander around and end up needing to be rescued ourselves. If we do plan on searching, we need to do so safely. Stick together in groups of two, you know, the body system, and if possible have some way of communicating with the other groups. I'm guessing since everyone is a hardcore LARPer, they didn't bring their cell phones, and even if they did, they might not work too well on the ground. Instead, we should have access to walkie-talkies. While exploring, we need to make sure that we have some means of finding our way back. If we have rope on hand, we could tie to something in the intersection and take the rest of the length with us into a tunnel, which would lead to a clear return path. Another option is to use markings on the walls to indicate where we have been and where we came from. Any of these solutions, or a combination of them, would make getting lost while exploring a non-issue. Yasmin and Andre find a vault door with a live owl on the other side of it. They ignore it, for some reason, and keep searching. Now you would think they would be a bit surprised to see that, but I don't know. A living creature behind a sealed door tells us that there should be more than just one way in and out of here, which would be incredibly important to know. Harry and Laura find a sealed gate marked Danger. She notices some fresh scrapes indicating that the gate has been opened recently, so goes in to investigate. Harry tries to convince her to turn around, claiming that it's been more than 10 minutes already and that it's dangerous. 
Well, he is not wrong, this is almost certainly where Gregorio would be, and Laura is right that he could have gotten hurt or unable to respond. Now, Marcus went off on his own, wandering random halls until he stops because he thinks he hears something. Well, it was just Robin having some extra fun. Meanwhile, Yasmin and Andre's path has somehow taken them back to the beginning, while Laura and Harry find a shack in a chamber. Laura goes to investigate it while he keeps begging for them to go back. As Laura approaches the open door, it slams shut hard enough to break the glass, and we see the ghost girl on the other side. Laura and Harry escape as soon as they glimpse at it. Now they run all the way back to the main bunker, where everyone else is waiting for them. Laura says she saw a ghost, but no one seems to believe her, not even Harry, who I guess was just running because she was as well. A ghost does seem like a difficult thing to suddenly believe in here, but someone or something had to have slammed that door shut. You can't make that part up, at least. They should all go back together and investigate the shack to find out what it was, or all get out of here right now while they still can and send help back later for Greg. They all decide to do the latter, which is kind of nice, claiming that there is no point in staying any longer. Unfortunately for them, when they get to the bunker doors, they find them shut and locked. Harry tries banging on the door and screaming, but that goes as well as you would expect when dealing with military-grade material. Yasmin bitterly blames Greg for all of this, assuming that this is all part of the game, while Laura tries to defend him. Marcus interrupts to keep the peace, saying whether this is Greg's doing or a natural screw-up, they need to focus on escaping. He then asks Robin if they can get the old radio equipment from the base working, and they go and try. Everyone else returns to the main hall where they start to hear some woman singing an Italian song from the 30s. Andre thinks Marcus just put on some good music, but the others state that it doesn't sound like it's coming from the speakers. And for some reason, no one attempts to find the source of the singing. Well, Laura then finds a recorded message from Greg where he says to enjoy the end of their game before going to New York if she makes it out alive but quickly follows it up with a laugh claiming that it was just a joke and that he loves her. Now this is enough to convince everyone that Gregorio is in fact behind everything. Obviously, we shouldn't just assume things from a single obscure message, but I can't blame everyone for coming to this rational conclusion. The group disperses with everyone doing their own thing. Laura takes a PG-13 shower, Andre goes exploring a service tunnel, and Yasmin goes to get some food. While doing so, she ignores some obviously suspicious sounds, then finds maggots inside a freshly opened can. Robin goes to the upper level in order to attach some cables for the radio system. When doing so, they accidentally knock over a mannequin, which happens to crack the glass. Seems harmless enough, but I am sure that there was a reason why the camera focused on it. They return to the level below and use the radio eventually getting a signal and sending out an SOS. While doing so though, the landline phone rings. What? They, they have a landline? Why didn't they try using that for help already? Now Robin answers the phone and hears the same singing in Italian everyone else heard before, when suddenly the crack in the glass above expands and shatters the window, dropping giant shards down below. Robin probably should have moved the moment they noticed the cracks expanding, but I still can't fully blame them for falling to this when there was clearly an unforeseeable supernatural element at play. Now, Laura finishes her shower and doesn't question why the lights are now red for some reason. As she approaches the mirror, she notices the reflection is that of the ghastly girl stalking her. She leans in to get a better look when a hand reaches out and grabs her, forcing her face to the glass. As she opens her eyes, she is now the reflection of the very much alive ghost girl, whose name is Clara, and is seeing through her vision in the then present time of 1944. Clara is in the bunker shack that they have found earlier, surrounded by Nazi soldiers enjoying a meal. They ask her to sing for them, but she seems too nervous for it, until a specific soldier is able to convince her that their time could be very limited thanks to the war. This persuades her as she starts singing the same Italian song we heard before. As she sings, we see flashes of her with the soldier that encouraged her, making love together and happily rubbing her baby bump, making it very obvious that they are a couple and she is pregnant. 
The song is interrupted by a loud noise waking Laura up from the bathroom floor. Now, was this all just a dream, or does this ghost want Laura to have this specific vision for a reason? Harry is there and helps her, assuming she fainted and hit her head. She claims to have seen that ghost again, but he ignores that to focus on a tragic event that just occurred with Robin. They all gather in the radio room to see what has become of Robin, who was literally shredded by the falling glass. Harry then insists Laura tells him of the ghostly experience she just had. Not sure why he feels now is an appropriate time for this, but okay. Laura tells him what she saw and about the pregnant Clara. This just further pushes Jasmine's belief that Greg and her are playing some sort of messed up game, and she claims Robin's blood is on both of their hands. Harry comes to Laura's defense, but Yasmin just shoots him down, saying no matter how much he acts like a white knight, Laura won't sleep with him. Yeah, they are cousins. And yes, it is about time someone pointed out how romantically protective he is with her. Still, could have waited for a better time. Cooperation is key in this situation, and we really don't need any more enemies. Marcus leaves to go to use the restroom. Once inside, he shows how distressed he actually is, hyperventilating and throwing off his tie. While weeping, the door locks by itself, or perhaps with some ghostly influence. Now, renewed with self-confidence, Marcus goes to leave, but his electric wheelchair starts to malfunction and spark, which either reminds you of Final Destination or a scary movie, depending on your personality. Now, one spark is enough to put his pants on fire as if he bathed in gasoline before. He calls for help and waves at the flames as they spread. Now, waving at the fire is probably not a very effective way to survive this scenario. Also, I want to get the obvious right out of the way. Having paralyzed legs sucks. In this case, however, at least he can feel his limbs being burned to crisps, okay? So there's always a silver lining to everything. In fact, the best thing he could have done would have been to undress his upper body clothing as quickly as possible and avoid damage to this part. He didn't do any of that though and quickly became a neglected torch Christmas tree, but apart from removing upper body clothing and use it to try and extinguish the flames, he could have also dropped down to the floor and try and roll around. Granted, that is very challenging with non-functioning legs, however being a flame it's still better than sitting in a wheelchair with plastic parts on it that will just cause an even greater damage. Of course, for all of you boring people out there, yeah, he could have just used one of the four sinks in front of him. That's right. In the end, Marcus is consumed by the fire and becomes the next victim in line. The group eventually kicks down the bathroom door and discover his body. Andre discovers some old archival footage of the bunker and suggests to watch it to see if there is an alternative exit anywhere. They all gather in the projector room to do so and as they watch, he gives a history lesson about this location and explains that the Americans eventually tunneled in and took out all of the soldiers. The footage then shows a familiar scene as we see Clara singing her Italian song to the soldiers at dinner tables. As Laura witnesses this, she passes out once again having her consciousness transferred to the past as she looks out from the eyes of Clara. Now we get to see what interrupted her song in the first place. It was a battalion of American troops firing blindly into the shack. She survived somehow as the Americans turned their attention to the rest of the bunker. However, every one of her comrades are dead, including her lover. She stumbles her way out of the shack and gets a few feet away, but then drops to her knees as she looks down to notice a deadly wound on her abdomen. Now, If that didn't kill her, it almost certainly killed the child within her. Now, back in the present, Laura is hunched over on the ground in pain. This reaction is freaking out Andre, who claims that she is just faking it. When she doesn't stop, because she isn't faking it, he gets angry and walks over to confront her. At this point, Harry jumps in to rescue her again and pulls out a knife to get Andre to back off. Now, pulling out a knife seems a bit excessive for someone being just a bit confrontational. It's unlike Andre threatened to hurt anyone. But wait, that knife also seems a bit familiar, doesn't it? It is the fake one that Gregorio was seen to have in his boot. How did Harry acquire it? Now, Andre recognizes this knife as a fake and quickly disarms Harry with a well-placed punch. Harry then crawls towards a wrench to use as a weapon, but Andre just mocks him and keeps it out of his reach with his foot before picking it up himself and clobbering Harry in the head with it. 
Harry may have started this, but Andre is clearly taking things too far, and they all should really be trying to stop him. He then starts approaching Laura, proclaiming that if she doesn't open the doors, the next body will be hers. She continues to try and convince him that this is all the doings of a ghost, but he just doesn't buy it. Thankfully, for Laura's sake, the projector catches the film reel on fire, distracting Andre for the time being. As he removes his coat to snuff out the fire, he reveals actual extremist tattoos covering his body. So either he was really committed to playing his character, or this entire LARP session was real for him. Andre turns his attention back to attacking Laura, but Cheap is saved by Clara grabbing him and dragging him away into a gas chamber, and the rest is history. Meanwhile, Laura and Yasmin drag an unconscious Harry to a nearby cot. Laura then decides she needs to confront Clara as she believes the ghost is trying to protect her unborn child and will show them the way out. Yasmin reluctantly waits with Harry to make sure that he stays okay while Laura heads to the shack. When she gets to the warning gate, it opens on its own, so I guess she is doing something right. Now Harry starts to wake up, asking where Laura is, before he starts accusing Yasmin of hurting her. She attempts to keep him calm and that Laura will be back soon, but Harry just calls her a liar and shoves her away forcefully with a crash off camera. He then runs towards the shack as well, shouting Laura's name. Now Laura makes it to the shack again and this time manages to get inside. There, she finds Gregorio strangled to death. At least, she will soon claim that he was strangled, but I see no damage to his neck, and she never checks his pulse either. For all we know, he could just be unconscious. Hard to believe how close they were to finding him when they first investigated this place. Too bad the ghost scared them away when they never thought to come back and check it fully. Now, Harry arrives soon after, and Laura immediately assumes that he is the murderer. Seems like a leap in logic to me, at least from her perspective. I mean, they have witnessed firsthand a ghost murdering a member of their group, so why assume the cousin, who was believed to be sweet and innocent in her eyes, would be capable of murdering her lover? Now, for us, of course, the audience, well, we have seen the jealous rage building, the suspicious behavior, and are aware of Harry somehow getting a hold of the fake knife that was in Greg's possession. So, if any of you figured out this amazing twist, congratulations. For everyone else though, I can completely understand suspecting supernatural foul play being responsible for this, especially since it was the ghost that prevented us from finding the corpse in the first place. Now, Harry immediately confesses the murder though, stating that Gregorio didn't deserve her and was just taking advantage of Laura's self-sabotaging tendencies, but he won't let her hurt herself anymore. Her response is to knee him in the stomach while calling him deluded and rushing to grab a piece of glass to use as a weapon. Harry is able to grab her leg though and bring her to the ground, where he then climbs on top of her and begins choking her, mocking the fact that she typically likes this sort of thing in bed. I said no king shaming, you know? Clara then appears, floating over the two of them, before she possesses Laura. Her violent spasms are enough to get Harry to back off. He then starts apologizing and goes to see if she is okay, but the Clara-possessed Laura grabs a mirror shard and stabs it into Harry, killing him in the process. She leaves the shack, holding the spot over her womb and humming that Italian song. She passes Yasmin, who is bleeding to death on the floor, having apparently hit her head after Harry's shove. She then continues to very painfully slowly leave the bunker and prepares herself for the new world. I suppose since this movie has themes of LARPing, this indicates Clara will now pretend to be Laura in the real world, giving birth to her baby and pretend that it is her own in a way fulfilling the bonkers purpose of playing out a fake history, which is kind of a nice ending if you think about it like this. Anyway people, thank you so much for watching, hope you've enjoyed this episode and you take care, binge another one and peace out.